What's that? I go to sleep. I've been on the weather all day. I'm going to try not, not to let you go to sleep, that, Mr. Rodney. I promise. I'm, saying, I'm not meeting Rodney. So I, I, I'm, I'm going to promise I'm not going to, I'm not going to uh, try to put you to sleep anyway. Uh, there's a little video toward the end that we're going to watch. It may be kind of. But uh, get your Bibles. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 1. Um Just to, just to begin with a word from the word, since that's what we're since that's what we're talking about. So if everybody's got Hebrews chapter one, and I'm reading from the New King James. Hebrews chapter one, verse one. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers, the prophets, to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his son. And I'm going to stop right there, simply because that right there says it all. That I want to, I want to take just that first half of that first sentence God has at various times and various ways spoken and the writer of Hebrews you know, says he's spoken to us. That's the reason why this study I think is very important. Um, and from my experience, I, hey. a lot of times there are some misconceptions um, and a lot of it's our fault from where we are in time we've kind of taken things for granted um, does anybody know just kind of curious what 2017 represents in church history any guesses 2017 is the anniversary of Martin Luther Nailing his 95 theses to the door of the church, of the castle church at Wittenberg. Most ch modern church historians point to that as the, the, the launching pad of what would become the Protestant Reformation. Those 95 theses in and of themselves were not significant. I've, I've read them and, and they're, they're kind of, esoteric but they ask interesting questions because that, because all Martin Luther was wanting to do was start a debate all he wanted to do was was to to kick around ideas to see what was going on if people were seeing the same things that he was seeing but that's why we have to where we are today if you're a believer in Christ these three words should be the foundational statement of your belief that the Bible has authority because it's inerrant and because it's inerrant it has application. If the Bible's errant, it has no authority. If it has no authority, it has no applicability. One flows from the other into the other and back again. They're tightly linked. Which brings us to the purpose of this study, which is to provide a meaningful foundation for studying God's Word. Now the purpose is we need to define and apply the terms that we use to describe God's Word. And finally, it's to equip us as believers. Um, I'm a student, and I am taking years of study and I'm kind of bringing it down into a more manageable format I hope that that's my aim at the the on page 11 is a short bibliography so that you know I'm not just pulling this stuff out of thin air of some of the materials that I've referenced where you can go and you can you can, these books are commonly available. You can find them. 
you can you can get them and you can check me on anything. I just want you to know I'm not pulling this stuff out of thin air. This is this is scholarship. These are good solid scholars. Now I'm, I'm going to go ahead and tell you I'm recording these, and my intention is to put them on YouTube so that they can be shared, so people can see them, so that so that they can be shared among church, so that reach a greater audience. But I'm going to post them, a link to them at my blog, which is triggermanblog.wordpress.com, and you can search for me on YouTube at triggerman1976. Now, my blog, I've got all kinds of um, articles on there. Um, I've actually I actually took about four months out of my life and responded point to point to a to an atheist on there. He had a website called you know uh, 50 Reasons Why God is Imaginary, and I went through point by point and refuted him. I believe at every point. That's on there. I, I've 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 dealt with. Liberals, I've dealt with conservatives, I've, I've put information out there for, for people to find. And so before we really get in in this introduction, there are a couple questions. Some foundational questions where we, where we have to find out where we are and what we know. So um, kind of a trivial pursuit kind of point. You might know what the two largest New Testament textual variants are. So define textual variant. Textual variant is where there is a significant interruption in the text. Where there is where something that just appears in the text, in the transmission of the text which is another thing we're going to be looking at, how the text was transmitted over time. But there's two, and there are, I think, 11 verses each that have actually been jammed into the text. John 8. John, well, it's John 7, 50, 59 through 8, 11. Mark 16. And Mark 16, 9 through 20. These are the two largest textual variants, and they just appear... In the text, nobody can explain why. And actually, if you have a, if you have a, a fairly updated Bible, depending on the translation, and depending on how how the Bible's edited, um, it will note that there are actual that, they, that these are there. They will bracket them off, or it will have a footnote out there, um, which brings us into some questions about how we need to deal with these texts and hopefully we'll get into that um, what's the Septuagint anybody got any idea what the Septuagint is well that's the Pentateuch the Septuagint is interesting the Septuagint is it's a translation it is the it is a translation of the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament, into Greek. It is, um, and it. What's interesting is it represents both uh, an exercise in history of scholars putting together a text into a coherent the all the available books of the Old Testament into one into one group. This is the Bible of the of the New Testament church. This is the this is what Paul had. This is what Peter had. This is what Jesus preached out of which, which, this is what Peter and Paul would have preached out of to their to their churches across the world. Um, here's an interesting one it's talking about translation. What language did Jerome translate the Bible into? Starting about the 5th century, 4th, late 4th, 5th century. Jerome translated the, he was interesting, Jerome, one of the few church fathers who was fluent in Hebrew and fluent in Greek. 
he translated the he from the Hebrew into Latin and from the Greek into Latin. His work became the church, the Bible of the church for 1,100 years in the form of the Latin Vulgate. And as a matter of fact, when his when his Bible was first seen, it caused a riot, which is an interesting historical, um, because he actually translated something correctly, which was very interesting. And speaking of our, our text that we opened with, uh, who wrote the book of Hebrews? Paul. Barnabas. Yes, uh, I would, you know, I see James in it myself. I, I see, I see James because of the yeah. because there's so much of the of Leviticus in it, and the way the letter of James is heavily dependent on Leviticus. Um, you might know what the Muratorian fragment is. Come on, Jay. Everybody knows what that is. <laughs> <laughs> the Muratorian fragment that was found about the 10th century, 9th, 10th century, if memory serves me correct. But it has text in it from the late 3rd century, from about, or from, or second, late 2nd century, about 180, AD 180. It has a list of New Testament books in it. It's probably one of the earliest canonical lists of the New Testament we can find. And finally, here's a good one. Does anybody know what Ryland's P-52 is? I'm going to guess no because of the silence. Ryland's P-52 is a credit card sized fragment of John. Now what's interesting about, about that credit card sized piece of John, it's written on both sides from chapter 18 of John. Specifically, it's Jesus' interaction with Pilate. So it's got two verses on one side and two verses on the other. What's interesting about this is up until about the early 20th century, the scholarly consensus was that John was a late 2nd century, probably early 3rd century work. That was it. People, scholars were sold on it. About 19, I think it was 1947, a guy cataloging parchments in, in papyri in the British Museum finds this little credit card sized piece of, of parchment and looks at it and he goes, wait a second, that looks like John. That looks like it's from John. Well, sure enough, he looks at it and he actually goes and reads it because it's kind of, it's written in a funny script, but it's John. And he sends it off and gets it dated. Now keep in mind, the, early, the next earliest copy of John that we have is 3rd century. It's P66. Papyrus 66. One guy looks at it and he says, I'm going to date it to about 150. Third guy looks at it and he says, I'm going to date it to about 125. Third guy looks at it and he goes, I'm going to date it to about 95. They're looking at the style of script and, and the, the way the letters are formed, which make which by just dating it at 150 blew a hole in a battleship of scholarship and sunk it. It sent roughly 200 years of scholarship to the furnace because of a credit card size piece. It was the earliest copy of a New Testament manuscript we have. There is rumors that we have an earlier, that we have ones about the same age of Mark, which is, which most scholars will argue that Mark is the young, is the oldest by, by being first. But what does all this have to do? All of this has to do with the fact that The Bible, if we think of the Bible as the means by which we grab a hold of reality, if we think of it like a rope, its authority, its inerrancy, and its application are what we can grab a hold of to hold on to reality. 
it defines what is real. It defines what is true. It defines what is meaningful and gives us the ability to speak. And because it has the authority to define these things, because it's inerrant, it can give us certainty. And because it is both authoritative and inerrant, it can apply to all cultures at all times. But that brings us to the question. 